Welcome everyone to uh, today's session on existential threats and risks and solutions. Um, so uh, we're uh, gathered to get today with a, a group of um, our distinguished experts from the extra working group. Um, so that stands for existential threats and risks to all. Um, it's a working group of the World Academy of Art and Science, um, and I have the great honour of chairing that group. Um, and uh, in essence, the scope of this meeting today is to cover um, all the main threats and risks that we face. And we're here from our very um, experienced and distinguished uh, presenter, uh, Mike Marin uh, at the beginning of the uh, the presentations on are we all doomed um, who will outline the key threats and risks that we face um, this will be followed by a series of other presentations exploring in depth um, the key challenges that the world faces today so this ranges from the planetary emergency, um, the mm -hmm. continued risk uh, in terms of nuclear disaster in, and threats to peace, um, as well as the risk of future pandemics um, and emerging technology. Um, we will then be moving to a panel session of uh, from the Global Youth Security Council um, for existential threats. And I'm really pleased to be able to welcome uh, these youth leaders um, who will be uh, presenting um, and discussing the kind of key solutions um, that they are exploring and advancing um, as a Youth Security Council as part of an initiative um, between One Young World, a youth leadership movement, um, and the Interaction Council, uh, a group of former heads of government. So this is an intergenerational um, initiative that aims to strengthen governance, um, to uh, advance a strategic approach through something called Strategy X, um, as well as to um, take forward uh, solutions, digital solutions through a digital platform, along with um, partners with the Commonwealth Centre for Digital Health and the recently relaunched and re-updated um, uh, Global Futures platform for planet, people and peace, um, as well as uh, strengthening the response to advocacy and this is an important role that the World Academy of Art and Science um, particularly can play in terms of uh, providing expertise and advocating for solutions to um, address the many challenges that we face. Um, and ultimately as well, uh, the World Academy of Art and Science has a, a particularly unique role in strengthening leadership. Um, and we'll hear more about that um, in terms of an advance, uh, a proposal, a joint proposal to advance leadership uh, in terms of creating the, the leaders that we currently need and the leaders for the future going forward. Um, so uh, just in terms of context as well, just to say that the global security agenda is obviously critical for human security and you need security at global level to be able to advance and support and enable the SDGs. And we'll hear more about some of these agendas and the importance of uh, strengthening governance and infrastructure and the international security infrastructure as well from our panelist um, presenter, David Harris. Um, so uh, I see that Mike is uh, with us um, and I know he's presented, he's pr uh, spent a lot of time preparing um, a very, uh, insightful um, review and uh, think piece to get this panel uh, started. Um, so I just want to ask Mike, are you ready to uh, share this with us? And if you could uh, introduce your um, formal title and experience as well at the beginning, that would be greatly appreciated, Mike. Existential threats and risk is an increasingly important and evolving transdisciplinary concern. It is also a key futures perspective involving probable, possible, and preferable futures. I'm not sure how I 
got into doing a bibliography, whether Joe asked me or I foolishly volunteered, but I ended up uh, when we first formed our working group uh, doing a bibliography and it ended up of 103 items in 20, an annotated bibliography, 103 items in 22 pages, and I locked it up in, in May of 2023. I don't know if anybody read it or even looked at it, but it is available at securesustain.org. For a still longer bibliography, you might look at the Center for the Study of Ex Existential Risk at Cambridge University, which has a Terra bibliography. The Existential Risk Research Adjustment is what Terra stands for, based on numerous uh, journal articles, but no books or reports. Both of them, in any event, are too long. And we live in a world of infoglots, so I recently set out to write a very brief overview on 10 key ideas. And I got a four-page overview, and I was planning to do a five-page overview with uh, three pages, two pages to describe the, the basic ideas, and then uh, three pages for uh, citations. And then I saw this article in the June 10th New Yorker saying, are we doomed? Great question, and right to the point. And it describes a course that's being taught at the University of Chicago. And I think this is an even better focus than what I had, so I, rearranged it, and, and I think it leads to seven questions about what, how, when, who, what causes priority actions, and how much hope. And I also hope to sum that up in five pages in, uh, in several weeks. So there's much to cover here, and I can only collect bottom lines of selected reports and articles, and I must necessarily zip over the treetops to get a rough and tentative sense of the forest. The basic question, are we doomed? And anybody who just answers yes or no, this is far too simplistic. Rather, any informed answers will be, it's possible or it's probable. At the extreme, you could say that it's unlikely, or that doom is unlikely or very unlikely, or if you're a pessimist, you could say that it's certain or near certain. My position is in the middle range of the probable pessimism, roughly 70-75%. The seven questions and the brief answers to follow will support my position of uh, what, how, when, who, what causes priority actions, and how much hope. Uh, everybody is encouraged to question these questions as well as my answers as to what is missing or overstated or understated. Okay, first question, what? The major categories of existential risk have remained the same for several decades, uh, uh, other than artificial intelli intelligence, which is the new kid in the block. And just uh, although there had been some talk about it before last year, but since last, last no, November, it's uh, it's uh, very much very prominent. Uh, Major categories are nuclear war or accident, uh, climate change, biodiversity loss, pollution, pandemics, and natural disasters. AI and biotech are the, the, simply the recent ads. Threats and risks for all except the pure natural disasters, that's a natural disaster that isn't aggravated by climate change, are clearly increasing. I just give three very different examples in, in, the, in the literature. Uh, first is the Billiton of the Atomic Scientist Doomsday Clock, which uh, Doom, Doomsday Clock for last January, it says it's still 90 seconds to midnight. They have, quote, a deteriorating, deteriorating state of the world just regarding nukes, tonic, uh, bio threats, and AI. The second uh, uh, document, uh, which you may be familiar with, is the uh, World Economic Forum Annual Global Risk Report, now in the 19th edition, also out in January, which ranks 34 global risks, both in the next two years and the next 10 years. And it also has uh, virtually the same bottom line. They see a deteriorating global outlook. 
The third document is comes from the United States Director of National Intelligence. It's the Nash Annual Threat Assessment out in February, which reports an increasingly fragile global order and cites uh, some two dozen threats. Second question, how? Uh, how does how does uh, doom occur? Well, it can it, turn, it can occur very fast if uh, if a nuclear weapon goes off. It's a matter of minutes or hours, I guess. And uh, also, if an asteroid hits hits Earth, although there is increasing attention to that, and it's actually a technology trying to knock an ongoing asteroid out of orbit. Uh, otherwise, uh, a disaster would take several years, for example, a pandemic and possibly uh, artificial intelligence or decades in the case of climate change, but climate change is, is quickening, or it might be uh, more than several decades, as in uh, the biodiversity loss. Uh, the uh, doom can be direct, similar to all of the uh, categories that I mentioned, or simply indirect uh, uh, wars and growing autocracy and polarization and backlash, which are all going to aggravate any uh, any possible doom. To dive a bit deeper, uh, I, I want to briefly discuss nukes, uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, there's a growing interest in nuclear weapons because of new technology, upgraded arsenals, more actors, uh, less regulation, and uh, the Oppenheimer movie, which won seven Academy Awards uh, er earlier this year. I was just reading in the uh, uh, Times this morning, last uh, last uh, Sunday's Times, the uh, recent meeting between uh, Putin and uh, Kim Jong Un uh, of North Korea, in which they are uh, showing their friendship for each other and support, and uh, Russia may even support North Korea's nukes, whereas in the past, both Russia and China were supposed to restrain them, but that's just one small step towards uh, a possible disaster. Uh, the CPRI yearbook that just, just came out in June uh, notes that global, quote, global security continued to de deteriorate throughout 2023 as it has for the past decade. While global military spending rose for the ninth consecutive year to 2.4 trillion, which is a 6.8 increase over 2023. Uh, all of that, of course, is uh, is ominous. Uh, the second uh, major category to mention is, is climate, because this is, uh, you, you might say it's the elephant in the room of existential threats and risk, because um, many people are experiencing uh, climate ri risks in, uh, in, di in different forms. And uh, it, it certainly certainly will worsen. Uh, it's just a question of how much and how soon, and it will almost surely lead to tipping points. So take a look at the University of Exeter Global Tipping Points Report, which just came out last December, which identifies 25 Earth system tipping points, six in the cryosphere, 16 in the biosphere, and which includes the Amazon, which is very important, and four in ocean circulation. Some of them are far in the future, but at 1.5 degrees C warming, widespread motor mortality in coral reefs and potential tipping for boreal forests and mangroves. At two degrees C, uh, that's not imminent, uh, but maybe in a decade or so, uh, the Greenland and West Antarctic ice sheets will collapse, in which case you'll really see a rising sea levels. A related concern uh, to climate is the planetary boundaries concept articulated by Johann Rockström et al. in 2009. The latest from Rockström and 21 other states that six of the nine boundaries have already been crossed, including climate change, biosphere integrity, land use, fresh water, and uh, biogeochemical cycles of nitrogen and phosphorus. The chart also shows 16 tipping elements. So uh, uh, clearly there's a lot to worry about in, uh, in climate and uh, tipping points. The third concern is uh, 
artificial intelligence, and I'll make three brief statements. First, uh, you must recognize that there is much competition within and between nations with billions of dollars being invested to uh, uh, perfect AI. Uh, secondly, there are many potential good things uh, that may, can result from AI, uh, especially uh, education, uh, which uh, uh, and the health and law. And the new following panels, uh, two successive panels here uh, for the Academy, number 9A and 10A are going to deal with the uh, upside of uh, AI. But there's also uh, lots of risks in, uh, and uh, uh, involved, especially disinformation and job loss and especially artificial general intelligence, which is a step forward in uh, uh, in AI because it, it uh, can do its own thinking and it's, it's, it's expected in the next uh, three to five years, according to a report by Jerry Glenn, who some, some of you know. Okay, third question. Uh, this follows from, from number two on the how is the when uh, doomsday can uh, overall can happen any day with nukes or sometime after the year 2100. But the next decades are the most important focus in my time frame for this 70 to 75 percent chance of large scale or complete doom is uh, the 2040 to 2880 period. That is roughly the next 50 years. Uh, again, as mentioned, uh, nuclear weapons uh, can uh, be detonated at any time. Climate will worsen as tipping points uh, kick in. Uh, argu arguably already has started. Uh, AI it's, uh, uh, could be uh, uh, catastrophic uh, as it kicks in before adequate governments uh, come, come to place. And there's a New Yorker article on uh, March 18th uh, about both the uh, uh, the doomsayers on AI, as well as the uh, accelerationists in California. And they just mentioned in passing that there are already a few hundred people working full time to save the world from from AI catastrophe. Uh, some of those, a few of those people are cited as having a P doom rating, meaning probability of doom of 99%. That's how pessimistic they are. In contrast, uh, biodiversity, uh, what it too, excuse me, uh, pandemics can happen at any time. And a lot of uh, public health people are watching the H5N1 bird flu, which uh, uh, may or may not uh, uh, develop a mutation and be become widespread. Finally, biodiversity is slowly growing uh, over, over decades. Question of, of uh, who is doomed? Uh, the we in the title is important, suggesting all eight billion of us, but most of us, uh, six or seven billion, perhaps even one or two billion, could well be considered as facing doom. In contrast, the Center for the Study of Existential Risk defines uh, existential risk as extinction of the human species or the collapse of civilization, which is, uh, to me, a narrow definition. And uh, it's important to acknowledge that existential threats are inequitable in both space and time, especially due to climate change, which is already responsible for heat waves and recently heat domes, uh, droughts, floods, increasingly, increasingly severe storms and wildfires scatter, scattered in many regions and virtually certain to worsen. This isn't quite doom except at the local level. In space, the most vulnerable groups are the poor, the aged, women and children, marginal groups in regions that are already hot. For example, New Delhi recently had 120 degree Fahrenheit temperature. Uh, many small island states literally face existential threat of rising sea levels. That would be in the next decade. But also, you have to consider inequity in time, and the lifespans of youth are threatened far more than those of seniors. Thus, with more to lose, youth groups have good reason to promote thought and action about uh, existential threats and risks. Okay, question five, root causes. 
how do we get into this polycrisis mess? Uh, the title of the May 16th WAS session was well, uh, Root Causes and Remedies. Uh, root causes were not addressed, I believe, and the remedies for rising insecurity were only lightly touched on. Both are broad and complex topics with many answers requiring far more than an hour to explore. For starters, I'll suggest three root causes. First, the absence of an appropriate information system. Transdisciplinary books, articles, and especially reports on global trends, forecasts, and proposals abound, but there's no system to identify them and highlight the newest and most important items. Thus, there's widespread fragmentation and no consensus on what, how, when, and who, as well as which actions to take. The second root cause, a growing tend to autocracy and less freedom. The latest Freedom House report on political rights and civil liberties and freedom in the world warns that global freedom declined for the 18th consecutive year. Autocracies can get things done more quickly, but seldom make good decisions in the public interest. The third <clears throat> root cause is our recent global shocks, uh, which are rather obviously obvious. The costly uh, COVID pa pandemic, Russia's war in Ukraine, which divided global politics between autocracies and democracies, and the Israel-Hamas war, which has divided national politics, at least in the U.S., between one-sided supporters of Israel or the Palestinians in Gaza, who has suffered 30 times the number of dead as Israel after the ugly 8 October 7th attack by Hamas. Both wars are costly and distracting with no end of sight. David Harris, who will follow me, adds that these are only two of 10 violent contacts, conflicts now underway. Moreover, there are three global shocks on the near horizon. The first one is that Donald Trump uh, wins the presidency in November, which the recent economist says two chances out of three. I, I hope this is uh, wrong. The second one, China invading Taiwan, which is on the horizon. I don't think it's probable in the next few years, but a lot, a lot of opinions on, on that. And then, of course, there's the bird flu, which may or may not take off. <laughs> okay, question number six. Well, what can and should be done? Idealistic agendas such as the SD, the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, Human Security for All, and uh, Four Ps are all well and good. But how do we get there and what are the priority actions? There are a few solutions to any problem, but plenty of programs are underway and proposals for prevention, mitigation, uh, or and or adaption and resiliency. The Security Sustainability Guide, uh, securesustain.org, has abstracts of 3,300 organizations, largely global NGOs, that explicitly or implicitly working for one or more of the sustainable development goals, including 400 organizations for climate, 260 for energy, and 59 for oceans. Either you don't know the SSG, or you are too busy to look at it, or you lack interest in other groups already doing what you're doing to save the world, as well as possible alliances. And the SSG lists some 308 alliances, coalitions, networks, and partnerships but no youth alliance that I know of. Numerous groups are working to mitigate or prevent each of these very different existential threats and, and risks. Very few groups are looking at all or most of the existential threats and risks. Typically, they are fragmented and use various terms such as risks, threats, catastrophes, global catastrophes, global shocks, systemic risk, polycrisis, megacrisis, and so forth. The final question, excuse me, three suggestions to promote thinking about uh, access and risk. Uh, first, uh, combine that, uh, combine, which is necessarily negative discussion of X thrust threats with positive agendas such as the SDGs and human security for all, as well as a priority actions. In turn, this would lend greater urgency to making progress on these agendas. Uh, second suggestion, engage sustainability and peace programs in academia. There aren't many, but at least we've identified some 50 PhD programs. There's many more master's programs. Uh, thirdly, encourage formation of a youth group alliance to promote 
uh, existential risk thinking with a frequent newsletter. The uh, Global Youth Security Council for Existential Risk is a good start, but there are at least 17 other youth groups that should be invited to join One Young World members, three of whom are on our panel today. The allied groups will not agree on everything, but should find it useful to learn what others are doing and what is most effective and, and, and where. Uh, finally, the question, well, how much hope is, and hindrance? At the end of the extraordinary eight-part Netflix series, Life on Our Planet, covering four billion years, the narrator, Morgan Freeman, gave only a brief overview of the sixth extinction now underway and concluded that we only have, quote, a glimmer of hope. But he also noted that unlike other extinctions, our species knows what we are doing. Well, this is not true because there's no agreement on where we are going and what we should do. Few are concerned with overall threats and extinction, and there's little or no money for doing so, contrasted to the high technology public entertainment of space exploration. To be generous, I'd say that there are a few glimmers of hope, notice notably the uh, summit of the future in September and many policy briefs following uh, the Secretary General's common agenda. But there are many overlapping headwinds that hinder progress. Uh, first, ignoring our outright denial of threats and risks. Second, backlash from conservative populist groups. Disinformation, which is greatly enabled by uh, artificial intelligence. Vested interests, notably oil and gas countries, but also farmers in Europe. Uh, higher priority given to pressing national and local issues that are real or imagined, major or minor, and uh, just abusing ourselves to death with uh, with, with uh, cable television and puzzles and games and uh, big time sports and so forth. In sum, there may be a few glimmers of hope if we are smart, lucky, united, diligent, listening, learning, and thinking differently. But given fragmentation and many headwinds, doomed for many, if not all, is more likely than not in the next 50 years. Thank you very much. Just to say a big thank you, Mike, as well. I know you've spent many hours um, reflecting on these really significant global challenges, not just with the extra working group, but also over many decades across your life. And your experience and insight and wisdom is highly value valued. So a big thank you. Um, and um, also just a, an appreciation for how you've uh, the narrative that you've communicated such complexity around are we all doomed um, and with the, the the sort of reflection of probably um, I would like to add to discussion going forward as well um, to say uh, I hope not if we are prepared and if we do something about it um, and with that, I'd like to introduce uh, David Harris, who has spent his life um, on global security challenges, more conventional global security challenges in terms of bringing about world peace um, and averting nuclear uh, disaster. Um, so it'd be great to have his reflections um, on how do we take a strategic approach by applying foresight uh, um, uh, systematic foresight uh, methodologies to addressing threats and risks to the existence of humanity um, and um, I think he's also going to share with us his reflections on how do we need to strengthen global governance the infrastructure ultimately around global security um, we've seen over this these last few decades the, the changing challenges threatening uh, human security and global security and ultimately um, our infrastructure, our, uh, our, our global architecture um, for addressing these security challenges needs to be uh, um, matched to the size and the scale and of, the, of these challenges. So uh, with that, I'd now like to um, ask David to kindly um, start his presentation and a big thank you David as well so and I'd just like to say um, David and Mike 
are in essence, I'd say my kind of core team uh, with the extra working group. Um, and uh, they've put in many extra hours uh, and uh, additional calls to kind of really bring together the thinking um, for the extra working group to really advance these agendas. Um, and they're highly committed uh, and dedicated individuals. A big thank you to you both. So, David. Good morning, everybody from Kingston, Canada. A uh, little bit of an introduction. I'm a pessimist. That's an optimist with experience. Uh, unfortunately, over the years, I've been in a number of rather messy situations where I have suffered. And the reason I am so keen on the extra working group and project is because the more people we get involved in this mindset of dealing with threats and risks going forward, the more likely we are that doom is not in our future. Um, I have a eight slide presentation, but I'm just gonna speak off it. Um, I guess my bottom line is there are no experts in the future. There are all sorts of millions of people that call themselves futurists, but the future hasn't come yet. Uh, but it's coming, and the future isn't going to be what it's like today, and that's one of the reasons there are no experts. Uh, the extra working group looks at the threats and the risks primarily as we know them today. We have threats and risks that are already in place. We have threats and risks that because of our situation today, we can predict and foresight and look forward to uh, happily or unhappily. But we have the inevitable threats and risks. And my little group here in Canada, uh, we have six other existential risks and threats for humanity, humanity. So that's people, planet, biodiversity, that we aren't dealing with yet. Uh, they are imaginable, uh, and they are not yet imagined. Uh, we have choices. This is one of the good things. We can be and remain as we are today, mostly reactive. We can work in the present on the issues that we have, our problems. And we can acknowledge what is likely coming, and we can acknowledge to the degree that we can work on those threats and risks. But we haven't made many good choices, in my view, about moving away from the present about not spending all our time working on the present. Why foresight? I have been invested, invested in foresight since 1974. And the reason that's so is because when I have not personally and professionally done foresight that I could have done, I had very, very bad days. Personally, professionally, physically, mentally, financially, and reputationally, I could have avoided in 1974, 1998, 1992 and three in the former Yugoslavia. The number of times foresight failed us was awful. And the surprises and shocks are continuing, as Mike has made very, very clear. Why foresight? Well, one of the reasons, there must be something going for it, because more than 80 countries in the world have formal foresight offices at the higher, highest levels of their government or their governance systems. Why foresight? Well, 
uh, I spent a lot of time in the military and the special forces. And if we didn't do foresight, uh, we would be so unprepared, even for the things that we knew were coming, that we would have been defeated every time we took action. The military, the security, and the intelligence communities use foresight every single day. I'm not saying they use it well, and I'm not saying they follow what they learn, but at least they're doing it. And only recently, in the last couple of weeks, there's been a call for a major foresight office in the United States of America that doesn't yet exist, uh, proposed by uh, an organization called the uh, Public Service Foresight Network, and also the Department of Human Security, uh, the Department of Homeland Security, uh, Freudian slip, Canadian Freudian slip there. The Department of Homeland Security has called for a an office of foresight. Uh, a little surprising that it hasn't already happened. Um, why not foresight? Why hasn't it happened more often? And my country may be one of the worst for doing it. We had foresight in almost every government office uh, until a previous prime minister, Mr. Harper, shut it down. Because, as we all know, talking truth to power sometimes isn't very successful. In fact, more and more isn't very successful, whether that's in autocracies or democracies. So another obstacle is what I call the experts with FOMO, F-O-M-O. FOMO, in this case, doesn't mean fear of missing out. It means fear of mounting obsolescence. Experts who are specialists, as technology advances quickly, are not keeping up with their field. They are falling farther and farther behind, and they don't want to have to lose their expertise. There are claims, some justified, that we're just too busy to worry about looking ahead. Busyness in the present. Uh, think of all the discussion about the poly crisis, which Mike is so aptly and fully described. I'm trying to look at my small slides here. Uh, the other thing about today that I've found is that more and more we are leaving the verb age, or moving into the verb age from the noun age. We used to have an alliance, and we used to have an alignment, but now constantly realigning. Alliances are ebbing and flowing. People are choosing which day, which place, which issue to ally with another. We have facts. Mike has made that very, very clear. We have info glut. We have facts that are just exceeding our ability to even keep track of all that exists, let alone knowing what the facts are about. Unverifiable, infinite number, alternate, incomplete, and so on. We have the technology imperative. There's a great deal of proof these days that technology is outpacing our human ability to continue to control it or regulate it or manage our lives so that it is not managing us. We have leaders who are absolutely convinced they know they're doing the right thing. And they aren't willing to listen to the question, well, if you know you're doing the right thing, why are things so bad right now? And that's not a criticism as much as it is 
a fact about human nature. Back to the business of truth to power. There are a lot of truths that power doesn't don't want to acknowledge. We just had a big shock here in Canada in a by-election, a federal by-election in Toronto, in which an absolutely, totally safe seat for the currently ruling Liberal Party, last time won by an outrageous amount, was lost to the opposition party. Uh, our prime minister is in significant disarray because of this, but he's insisted that he will stay on because, because he doesn't want to leap. So let me practice a little foresight just to provoke discussion. We're more or less in agreement that we are currently in a polycrisis. There are many threats, and many of their risks have already been made real. And some of those risks, frankly, will remain with us for a long time. So one of the pictures I see is that we're moving from a sort of dynamic polycrisis into a time of permi crises. They will remain with us. They aren't going away. Um, those that work uh, believing that there are solutions to major, huge problems, uh, which I don't agree with, uh, will find this very difficult to get over. I'm one for progress, not solutions. So we are going to have to pick and choose among the permit crises which ones to deal with. Second little piece of foresight. Artificial superintelligence, which a number of very, very brilliant people have in the last year pointed out, is either literally coming in the next months or year or two, might be our solution to the info glut. And maybe we should stop calling artificial intelligence artificial because it is what we are going to use. And super intelligence might allow us, might allow us to overcome parts of the information glut. And thirdly, we now have a multipolar superpower world. And it is becoming more and more multipolar. Now, whatever you think of what has happened in the past period, say since the Cold War ended, or if you want to go further back since the last great war, World War II, the superpower, however you defined it, uh, hasn't been very effective preventing, preventing us from permacrisis or polycrisis or whatever. So maybe this new multipolar superpower situation will help us deal with all the issues, including those that are not totally security oriented. Let me finish with three suggestions, which I've already met in our made in our in our extra group. One is we need to create create action. We need to create an academy that is global, in reach, but focused regionally on training people, all people, whether it's done in schools, whether it's done in neighborhoods, whether it's done by civil uh, support organizations, civil society organizations, it doesn't matter. But it has, people have to be trained to be better prepared for when disaster and prices strike while they're waiting for the formal first responders. One of the pictures on my wall off to the right is of Fukushima in 2011, where the people in Fukushima, the survivors of the disasters, and survivors are always the first responders, didn't know what to do, didn't have anything to do it with, 
and were just waiting for the first responders, who were, because of the disaster, lined up on a road to the south of the disaster zone because they didn't get in and couldn't get in. Those survivors could have been much better prepared. Second suggestion, an institution that is focused, in my view, in schools, maybe one period a week, teaching young people how to be better prepared to help their community, their family, their neighbors, their friends, protect their community from the effects of climate change, in health emergencies, uh, away from uh, crime and so on, and do this as a part of their education. Uh, too long have we focused on education as a school and teaching thing and not as a learning and skill thing. We have to get more skills in more young people earlier. And the third one is an internet, an, what I call, um, we've talked about this word in our project, intergenerational curriculum that allows, and in, in a number of languages, let's say the, the UN official languages, and get them, get people able to prepare and be willing to act in the face of what climate change is providing us. So three suggestions, all having to do with preparing people who, is, who are the keys to any actions in the future. What I'm hoping is that some of the time that we are spending, we, and this is uh, hopefully not a shot at this conference, but it is general. We are spending billions of dollars, millions, millions of hours, and tens of thousands of people repeating, thinking, and not doing. I would like to see much more doing. If people are trained to do more, maybe they will. Thank you. Thank you, David really useful insights and i've really valued our discussions over these last couple of years as well um and really just to emphasize the importance of foresight as a methodology to really strategically and systematically um, understand the links between threats and risks to um, human survival and existence um and i know that there's been some sort of disagreement in terms of the emphasis but I would also add this can also um, give valuable insight in terms of root causes um, that can enable um, preventive approaches or to build resilience um, and uh, ensure preparedness. Um, different challenges ultimately um, are more um, amenable to different uh, sort of targeting different approaches. And I think that's where we need to have a very systematic and strategic approach using foresight methodology to understand the links between the different challenges and where we target strategically and systematically um, our, uh, our collaborative efforts to essentially make the world a safer place. Um, so a really big thank you, um, David. You, you, you've also given me some very valuable insight over the, the last couple of years, um, which you may want to share a little bit more about on um, the the need to uh, renew and uh, modernize the global um, infrastructure in terms of the global security infrastructure. If you can say a few words uh, whilst um, Thomas uh, Reuter uh, gets himself ready for the next presentation. Thank you. So, um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, David, if you're able to say anything about the uh, international infrastructure on global security. Well, uh, yeah, yes, lots, but very, very briefly, um, uh, we've been priding ourselves and patting ourselves on our back in the developed countries about how developed we are. 
And we now have, in my country alone, seven major infrastructure disasters in Canada alone. Um, Calgary is Calgary. One of the richest countries, richest cities in our in, in our nation is currently under a many week state of emergency in good weather where there are no earthquakes, forest fires, uh, winter storms, uh, conflicts, but it's a state of emergency. Many people, including my son, who lives in a very, very expensive house, don't have any water because the water main broke. The water main that was supposedly for 100 years, but it's now in 49th year. Well, when it broke, of course, they had to try to repair it. When they started to repair it, they found out it needed repairs in a whole bunch of other places. This is a water main that you can drive a truck through. Bridges, dams, electrical grids. We have places in Canada where cities, small towns, have had massive brownouts, a few blackouts, because data mining, mining, and other demands on electricity have overloaded the grid. We did not used to have brownouts and blackouts in this country. We are undeveloping. Mm. So infrastructure has to be considered for humanity mm. a threat. Yeah, no, quite. And I think also in terms of the, aside from the sort of uh, sort of infrastructure at, at community level, at international level, we talked about the global security um, architecture around global security and the need to uh, include, for example, um, the the ability to address things like the planetary emergency. Uh, we've seen the sort of failings in terms of addressing pandemics, um, and ultimately in terms of bringing about a, a peaceful world as well. Um, so I, I think that, that might be something that we can sort of draw upon further uh, in, in further discussion. So I'm aware of time. It'd be great if we if I can now introduce. Um, Thomas Reuter, who's a, a um, board member, trustee of uh, the World Academy of Art and Science. Um, and um, he's going to also make some links, not just with the sort of the importance of understanding existential um, th threats and risks as part of a wider system, ultimately the polycrisis, um, and understanding the connections between um, different risks and challenges, but ultimately as well how it impacts upon uh human security how it affects people um through the uh, illustration of food security ultimately this isn't conceptual this is all <laughs> this is about how it impacts upon uh humans and communities and human security um and also it helps uh, to uh, us to understand the links with the sustainable development goals so um thomas can uh, are you ready to to start your presentation and a big yes. thank you. Thank you, Joe, for the introduction and most of all for your tireless efforts in keeping this group together and uh, um, and productive. Okay. Now, I'm going to talk about food security or the risks to food security that we are facing as an example of a pan-systemic risk. That means a risk that is connected to many uh many systems or subsystems that together define our existence. And I don't think of a food system as something physical, like an agricultural system, a uh, purely a distribution system. I also think of it, I think of it as an anthropologist that, that means holistically. Uh, for, so for me, Part of this system is also culture, politics, the kind of economics we have, whether or not we have moral ecologies. Moral ecologies are ethically based ways of relating to the world, to each other, and also to the environment. Uh, factors such as demographics, consumption patterns, and, and of course also the physical elements such as, such as climate, water, soil, 
and biodiversity, namely as a food biodiversity. But of course, we are in the Anthropocene, so those physical uh, uh, parts of the system are also uh, partly, sorry, partly influenced now by human action. The risk factors that I see to the food system, which is totally deeply embedded in the wider system of human life, is demand, supply, and distribution, or access. Demand will increase uh, significantly and by 2050 in because of population growth, but also because, especially in developing countries in Asia, uh, starting in Africa, per capita consumption is growing rapidly, and particularly demand for meat, which has a huge uh, places huge demand on land and water, <clears throat> and in turn affects climate change. One third of climate change is caused by agriculture. So you can see already the sort of feedback loops <clears throat> on the supply side. Um, the problem is that we've had a green revolution that has been pretty beneficial. It's uh, it's led to um, uh, population growth, and that's all very well, but there are limits to that growth. There's limits to what the um, soil can give, and it's already depleted uh, worldwide. We have a, a, a big, uh, a, a large amount of soil loss, and soil is only regenerated very, very slowly. Um, and then the distribution risk, the fact that the market is increasingly cornered by large cartels and uh, access is denied to a large number of people because they simply don't have the money to pay for food that is becoming more and more expensive. So on the uh, supply and demand side, we have a 69% gap between required calories and available calories by 2050. So that's just calories, and there's also a huge quality gap uh, because the food we are producing is becoming of increasingly poor quality. Not in all categories, but overall, definitely. And factors such as climate change can reduce uh, the uh, nutritional value of uh, major food groups such as wheat. So this... Um, in terms of external threats, I think climate change is probably the biggest. This map shows the areas where uh, a dark red is 50% loss of production, food production, and a light red, so 25%. And there's some areas that are green where productivity is going to increase. Look whether you can, can find Ukraine. You'll, you'll, you'll see it's in that green area. Strange coincidences, yeah. That's where politics comes into it. Okay, but the diagram, I'm not going to go into the details, I just don't have the time, but it shows just how complex the impact of climate change is on the food system. Um, and on the right, you see the number of people at risk of, of malnutrition and hunger. So, but the way they, the pathways are complicated, there's a lot of factors that influence how that impact is felt. This is, well, what I call access denied. You know, food is supposed to be one of the fundamental human rights, according to the United Nations. Again, this is the history of um, the idea of food as a basic human right. It's long and complex. I can't go into it. It's fast that, that, that in theory, you know, we, we uh, have recognized that. But in fact... People in poor countries and also downwardly mobile working middle classes in rich countries are now at risk uh, already, and more so uh, when a crisis hits, and it will. Um, it's only a matter of time before we have a simultaneous failure of some of the major breadbaskets due to climate disruption. Food affordability is already on the way down. Um, and there's incredible market dependence. People don't produce food anymore. It's not so long ago that even in Europe, 
uh, a large number of people produce some of their own food. Now it's very rare. So on a household level, also on a, a national level for many countries, dependency on the market is very hard. And that market is controlled by cartels. These are the big nine who have cornered the market, and that's what's called market failure. So the market is not operating freely anymore and competitively. It's actually being controlled. In the wake of COVID, we had huge price increases way beyond the increases in uh, in the products at the wholesale level. So we had price gouging. There's just been an inquiry, a parliamentary inquiry in Australia into price gouging by the two big uh, supermarket chains, um, Coles and uh, uh, Woolworths. And uh, they found, it's proven that they actually increased prices twice as much as they needed to. So this creates uh, further risk. <laughs> And also the fact that people are speculating with food, you know, in financial markets. <clears throat> okay, so we're dealing with a complex system. Here's another diagram that that shows some of the physical and cultural or social political aspects. And it's important to understand that you can't just solve the food. <laughs> Uh, security problem. You have to think of everything at once. That's where I think we are struggling. We're struggling to to, to have to develop systemic thinking uh, that is up to the task. Our minds are simply, you know, st overstressed with that task. And I I can I have a have an idea why that might be so. Uh, look at this. Uh, the different types of systems. Some are highly sophisticated, evolved, and I mean natural evolution. As a matter of survival, if you're better fed, if you know how to cook better, if you know how to nourish yourself better, the whole spectrum of activities that leads to being well nourished, having a good diet, that meant survival. So we have traditional systems that evolved over thousands and thousands of years. And they're highly sophisticated. And we have technocratic systems that large scale monocultures, highly mechanized, uh, loads of chemical inputs, um, uh, commercial motivations, and so on. So we have those new uh, mind produced systems that are, for all their high tech, really quite primitive compared to natural systems. We must uh, come to uh, a realization that uh, some humility is needed here, uh, especially from the side of science, and a need to recognize those traditional systems for being sophisticated. The proof is that uh, small farmers feed two thirds of the world with healthy food on less than a quarter of the arable land. The rest, the three quarters, is corporate owned. But those corporate farms mainly produce unhealthy sugar and fat rich foods, plus unecological biofuels and animal feed. So they're not really helping very much with the food security problem. They produce masses of calories, but that's not what we need. We need good nutrition, not calories. Okay. So keep that in mind. I just wanted to very briefly talk about one traditional system that I intensely studied for decades, um, starting with my PhD research, um, uh, right to my professorial fellowship grants research, and that was in Highland Bali. So I have a long-term view of this place. That's what it used to look like, forested, healthy ecosystem, biodiverse, uh, farms looked like this. They were hardly recognizable as farms. There were hundreds and hundreds of different food plants in the, in a small area. So much, it looked like a jungle. But everything there, you see, is actually infinitely usable and very resilient to climate uh, sh shocks or, or poor weather and so on. Something always grows there. <clears throat> 
But that's how it looks now. The forest is gone largely. We have some intense uh, vegetable farming in the lower areas and some by the, uh, by the lake. But elsewhere, it's all citrus fruit. It's monoculture for export, commercial motivation and all that. Now, what, what has happened from this traditional food system where you had hundreds of crops, sustainable, regenerative, aiming to feed people and keep them healthy, community-based, 100% food sovereign, yeah, autonomous locally, high food security, biodiversity, healthy people, and so on, unprocessed food, and no uh, non-communicable diseases at all. We had this sudden change that I was able to observe, a uh, shift to a single, single crop, highly contaminated land now, any chemical known to mankind is being used there now. It's an extractivist, destructive, cash-oriented approach. But it's about making money. It's market-oriented. There's no attempt at food sovereignty. People have to buy food there. You can't just eat oranges and, and lemons. So low biodiversity is unhealthy. People now eat processed food 90% of the time. And suddenly you have a mass massive epidemic of non-communicable diseases. There are also, there is a powerful movement that's trying to address this and trying to reverse these changes because they happen so quickly. People remember. The good thing in, in these countries where the, 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 um, the traditional systems were eroded fairly late is that it happened so fast, people remember what it was like before, and they want to go back. Many millions of farmers have committed to go back to more traditional methods, more sustainable, more community-oriented methods. So it's multi-layered. They have a different politics. They don't just do farming differently. They have a different politics, a different cultural attitude, different social attitude. So they're doing whole system change. And... Generally, you know, around the world, you have these regenerative farming movements in every country. And I think there's quite a bit of hope in that. So we need to think about what kind of systems we're really talking about and what a sophisticated system really is. I'm not saying technology is all bad, but it hasn't reached that level of sophistication anywhere near. Too many things are excluded. Too many things are treated as externalities because profit motive, and so on. So we, that's what I think we really need to uh, reflect on if we want to achieve food security and similarly other forms of security. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. So I, I think that was a really valuable um, presentation in terms of illustrating how we need to understand and appreciate the complexity of operating within a system and if we actually understand that applying foresight methodologies for example along with the actual solutions and what actually works um it really provides us valuable insight to actually focus on what works rather than you know what's fashionable um and it, i think one of the other kind of key things really to emphasize is the the really significant importance of food security if we look back in history about the collapse of civilizations um in the past of human civilizations it was mostly around mm. food and water security mm. so this is a really yeah. critical issue as we expand in terms of our population um with increasing threats um in terms of you know climate change and biodiversity loss also impacting on um, food security. So I think this is an area that we will need to keep um, revisiting um, and really pushing the agenda. The other key thing, I think, as well as about the emphasis of um, co-benefits that you've mentioned, um, if we get this right, we not only benefit uh, biodiversity, we benefit uh, carbon sequestration um, and, and sort of, you know, maximise carbon sinks, but we also benefit human health as well in terms of the explosion of the NCD uh, non-communicable disease agenda so a big thank you um thomas um and uh i'm aware of time so i'm now going to uh ask our new presenter um new member to the panel noel salazar 
um, who uh, Thomas is kindly um, invited to join our panel discussion. Um, we have a very tangible example on what we can do about it in terms of strengthening leadership to address challenges for the future. And I think this is something we'll move to further as well with the um, the, the youth-led panel. Um, so, uh, Noel, please introduce yourself um, and uh, your interest in this agenda at the beginning. And a, a really big thank you for bringing something that's very tangible um, as well to the thinking about what can we do in terms of um, creating solutions? What's the role that the World Academy of Art and Science might play um, and how we can also work with other partners like the academies, for example, um, in terms of scaling up um, education uh, for, for our future leaders to address these critical challenges. So, Noel. Um, uh, thank, thank you very you. much, Joe, for the introduction and thank you very much for uh, having me on this on this panel. I am uh, Noel Salazar. I'm a social and cultural anthropologist like like Tom, like Thomas. Um, and it will become very clear how my work connects to the issues that we have been talking about. And I must thank Joe for also ordering our presentations uh, following a particular <clears throat> logic, uh, which is actually very nice because mine really builds on what has been said so far without having to repeat things. And I think it's a nice bridge also to what will come uh, after my presentation. Uh, and I must I must preface by saying so what, what I will be talking about in this very limited amount of time is a very tiny example, but basically one of the, the questions that I'm trying to deal with is how how do we uh, make people that have not necessarily any expertise or not necessarily any interest or any awareness of uh, existential threats and risks, how do we bring uh, all these things that we have been talking about, how we how we do do we do we actually bring that to uh audiences, how do we inform audiences, how do we teach them, how do you learn, and I will be focusing on a very tiny example, and also uh, trying to draw lessons, what we can actually learn from, from, from that example, and how maybe we can move things uh, forward. So, uh, like uh, David has been saying also, uh, I also agree that people learn and know best by way of practice through an ongoing engagement with their environment, rather than by merely applying abstract knowledge. Praxis, I would argue, is not the antithesis of theory, but a thoughtful doing and reflective practice that requires a deep level of comprehension, contextual insight and critical reasoning. Aristotle called this phronesis, which in English is often translated as practical wisdom, or the ability developed through personal experience and deep reflection to make sound judgments and to know how to act or how to react to specific real world situations, including, of course, existential risks and threats. It is not about having all the answers, but in the first instance about asking the right questions. Practical wisdom includes emotional intelligence, virtue, and being open to different perspectives. If phronesis is the map, praxis is the journey, putting phronesis into action, allowing people to make informed, practical decisions about the world in which they live. Such practical wisdom is always situated or context dependent. It is socially constructed, it is co-created, and it is shared by people through relations with their environment. In some, practical wisdom is the result of the embodied and emplaced practices that produce it. While virtually every university across the globe is conducting research or offering teaching or training on one aspect or the other of existential risks and threats, very few are doing this from a framework or approach that also cons considers practical wisdom. And this brings me to my own research and teaching. I have long been preoccupied with the crucial role of education and teaching in dealing with existential risk and threats because the latter make education overwhelmingly important and deeply urgent. And I think the previous examples have, and uh, the previous uh, uh, presenters have also stressed that. The current educational system to support our understanding of systemic, social, economic, and environmental challenges is extremely lacking. The dominant pedagogical models around the globe are heavily and narrowly knowledge focused to prepare young people to function in the knowledge economy and society. While this is certainly necessary, the rapid rise of artificial intelligence that was already referred to 
among other societal developments, should make it clear that this is not enough. Where do people get an opportunity to learn practical wisdom? In this very brief presentation, I focus on university education, but the approach certainly merits attention in other levels of education too, including lifelong learning. As a member of the Young Academy of Belgium, I first engaged with transdisciplinary discussions about the future of universities. Since 2020, I am active in the Una Europa Future University Lab, or Unilab, first as a visionary and currently as a senior fellow. Una Europa is an alliance of 11 European top universities, and its future Unilab is a think tank aimed at rethinking the university and research institutions of the future. A similar exercise is taking place within the Metaforum think tank University of the Future, working group at my own institution, KU Leuven in Belgium, in preparation of its 600th anniversary in 2025. My involvement in the governments of my own discipline at the international level, first at European and then at global level, made me think critically about what is being taught in my own discipline, anthropology, in anthropology programs worldwide, and how things are being taught. I got together with some like-minded colleagues from different countries, and we obtained funding from the Wenner Grant Foundation to research this issue. Our project, which we named Antro Radikoi, aims to study across the globe how open a discipline like anthropology is to go beyond conveying the usual canon of knowledge and modes of teaching to create openings for what we call alternative modes of teaching. To a certain extent, this is a return to the traditional roots of anthropology, which was all about communicating the knowledge and wisdom anthropology is observed in other cultures, often indigenous ones, across the world. In the framework of our Anthro Radical project, I created a new graduate course entitled World Anthropologies. World Anthropologies is an approach intended to de-essentialize anthropology and to pluralize anthropological inquiry by building on non-hegemonic practices. It is a framework that is deeply influenced by the awareness of the problematic hierarchical relations in knowledge production, marked by the historical constructions of canons of expertise normally established by the powers of authorities that be. Students taking my course are expected to have at least the basic knowledge of the history of anthropology and of anthropological theorizing. And this is a slide that I will quickly skip, but this is from, from the syllabus uh, to actually uh, tell the students a little bit what the, course is, what the course is all about. And what is very clear is that this is uh, not necessarily focused on existential threats and risks, but it is very useful to actually deal with uh, existential threats and risks. During the first few classes, I sketched the common biases and gaps in anthropological, anthropological education as, is it, as it is currently organized. The contents of the rest of the course is not predetermined, but depends on the class dynamics. The group of many international students are immediately set to work in self-created small groups formed of the basis of either geographical area, language, or topic, and the topic can include and has included existential risks, they have to search for original source materials written and published in languages other than English, and we have an English-speaking program. Uh, they quickly find out that the usual internet search strategies are not very useful here. Many times they have to directly contact people abroad in order to find what they are looking for. The next step involves in-class presentations. Every week another group presents whatever they have found. This involves a critical reflection on the search process itself, a presentation on the contents of the source materials and the authors that produced them, and an in-depth class discussion. Many groups realize in the process that valuable insights not translated and published in, in English circulate much less internationally, and that mm -hmm. there are other scholarly language communities such as Spanish or Chinese with their own knowledge production and circulation, and sometimes uh, with, with insights uh, that are not translated or not translated yet. After the presentations and discussions, students prepare their final work. Either alone or in group, they have to think of efficient ways to communicate the insights they gathered during the course to a wider informed audience. 
In the past, these outputs have included traditional scholarly texts about web, uh, uh, scholarly texts, but also websites, podcasts, magazines, and videos. And this is something that is uh, quite important because uh, there are a lot of experts that have a lot of very valuable knowledge and very valuable insights. And the question is, how do we get uh, the the insights and the knowledge, the information, the wisdom? How how do we get that uh, spread as widely as possible? And I think here, uh, young people can teach us qu quite a bit. Course evaluations show that the whole experience can be frustrating because it takes students way out of their comfort zone. They are used to an educational practice in which teachers present them with nicely packaged knowledge. This course makes them reflect deeply on the dominant model, on both how they have been taught and what is being taught to them. Moreover, I believe that the hands-on approach in which they are confronted with problems that need to be solved is a nice way to instill practical wisdom in them. Sometimes it takes a while before this sinks in and the students start realizing that the process is more important than the products they come up with. It happens that former students write to me after they have obtained their degree and left university. Being in a working environment or in their personal lives where they are also facing issues to, to be solved, they recognize the usefulness of this course and what it actually taught them. And I will slowly uh, come to some concluding thoughts. In conclusion, we can better prepare future generations, I would argue, to deal with existential risks and threats by focusing educational endeavors on fostering practical wisdom rather than merely transmitting novel and oftentimes abstract knowledge. Both are crucial to make sound judgments and tack tackle existential risks and threats and potentially transform oneself and society. The World Anthropologies course, of course, does not directly focus on existential risks and threats, even though some students and student groups chose to work on the topic. However, the focus is not on the subject matter, but rather on the process students undergo throughout the course. Granted, this is only a small piece of what should be a much larger curriculum change that develops practical wisdom, including intersystems thinking, good judgment abilities, adaptive leadership skills, network mobilizing skills, a developed meaning and emotional intelligence and solid global ethics, all of which are imperative if we are to address existential risks and threats in an adequate and efficient manner. And everyone involved in any level of, of uh, teaching or education knows that uh, our, current, our current systems are very far removed from uh, what I've just, just been saying. I hope to have convinced you of the benefits of the kind of project presented here and the usefulness of an approach focused on teaching practical wisdom for education and training systems globally. As our Antro Radical project further develops, this and other educational initiatives will be scaled up and hopefully also aligned with, with WAS initiatives, including the ones of this working group, among others, on existential risk and threats, but also with UNESCO Most Bridges program which is specifically looking for new models of education to prepare the next generation for system transformation. And I think we will be very soon hearing uh, from this next generation. Thank you so much, Noel. Um, and it's really useful to have something very tangible as well that we can apply um, in terms of our thinking. And um, it's, it might be something that we'll hear from Lorenzo a little later about uh, a proposal on leadership. And I, I would encourage you to connect with him as well. So uh, as we're starting to uh, be pinched for time, I'm going to um, ask the uh, Global Youth Security Council for Existential Threats um, to kindly uh, introduce themselves. Um, and I'm very proud to present um, the representatives, we have uh, three very dynamic and talented young leaders. Um, they're all ambassadors from One Young World, leaders in their own right, and they've come together as a group of 14 um, uh, leaders uh, as part of a Global Youth Security Council for Existential Threats that was uh, initiated um, at the One Young World Summit uh, last September um, uh, chaired by uh, Bertia Hearn from the Interaction Council, um, along with uh, a member of the Elders. 
Um, so this initiative is uh, really starting to build momentum. Um, the young leaders have been meeting every month over the last year um, and are really starting to come together to, um, to, to enhance their impact in terms of ad advocacy, uh, a strategic um, uh, kind of um, response as well through Strategy X, um, and also really about trying to strengthen the gaps in terms of global governance as well, um, in terms of addressing existential threats, not just through their existence, but also by promoting um, an intergenerational um, governance board to address existential threats. Um, so let me uh, kindly introduce, um, uh, I think, is it Fatal? You're starting first in terms of a statement. Um, and then we have uh, Johan on uh, climate tipping points um, and Talita on uh, particularly focusing on uh, the health impacts as well and people. So um, Fatal, please uh, introduce yourself as well. Hello, good morning. My name is Fati Sengo. Um, I am a cybersecurity professional and a council member for the Global Youth Security Council. I am currently co-chairing the existential threats on AI. Um, thank you very much. So just whilst we're waiting, just to say that uh, the um, Global Youth Security Council consists of 14 uh, members from around the world with regional um, representation um, and uh, gender balance and also um, with a skill set uh, that covers um, planet, um, people, peace and also the uh, emerging technologies. So it, it really enriches the discussions and the impact that this council can have as well. Uh, many of the council members are also involved in uh, international organizations and UN organizations. We're, we're no doubt we'll hear more about that. Fatou, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Good morning, okay. panelists and attendees. I extend greetings on behalf of Global Youth Security Council for Existential Threats, representing young leaders from 14 countries across six continents. While youth present a great opportunity for the future of their economies and progressive social development, they are often excluded from decision-making processes that affect them. As a newly formed collective of youth leaders, we stand united in our commitment to addressing and mitigating existential threats to our planet, people, peace, and prosperity. To combat global threats, a unified global action is required. Global Youth Security Council for Existential Threats purposely is deeply entrenched in strengthening global and multilateral capacities to anticipate, prevent and alleviate existential threats that imperil society. Our overarching vision resonates with the, purpose, with the pursuit of creating a world that thrives in safety and prosperity, ensuring the well-being of generations to come. We acknowledge the limitations of existing international governance structures in effectively addressing the evolving nature of these threats. Traditional solutions and structures are not equipped to address this new generation of existential threats. Global governance is fragmented. States tend towards nationalism and decision makers are guilty of underestimation or denial. Our collective ambition is to harness the vigor and creativity of youth worldwide, empowering them to partake in building resilient societies and shaping global policies. We strive to create an inclusive space where the voices of the youth le young leaders are amplified, ensuring their active involvement in decision-making processes at local, national, and international levels. While localized solutions are vital to support affected communities, unified global action from a holistic perspective is imperative. Consider, for instance, community-led reforestation projects in various regions, while these initiatives showcase the power of local action in restoring ecosystems and securing livelihoods, a globally coordinated effort is essential. Collaborative endeavors involving diverse stakeholders and right holders, including indigenous people with rich traditional knowledge of their lands and practices can amplify the scale and effectiveness of such reforestation projects. 
by taking a right rights based approach to collaboration with indigenous people and incorporating their expertise these initiatives not only achieve ecological restoration but also promote inclusivity inclusivity and cultural preservation to realize this vision the global youth security council for existential threats aim to pursue a spectrum of objectives one governance governance reform advocate for further restructuring existing international and intergovernmental governance models to foster co global collaboration in addressing emerging threats. Two, sustainable decision making. We aim to advocate for a shift towards long-term and grassroots driven perspectives in international decision making to prioritize for the genera future generations. This approach lays the groundwork for solutions that are not only environmentally sustainable, but also socially equitable and economically viable. Healthcare infrastructure, we intend to develop a comprehensive plan to bolster global health infrastructure enhancing preparedness, cooperation and respond to health crises, including preventing future pandemics, creating one planet health system and transforming global health security with digital solutions. We intend to prevent conflict, prevent and resolution by formulating a coherent strategy to monitor global peace, support sustainable peace building and coordinate international conflict resolutions. Urgent environmental action. We intend to propose to, uh, policies to safeguard biodiversity across critical ecosystems such as oceans and forests to fortify the environmental resilience and, the confront, and confront the pressing challenges of the climate crisis. This urgent action becomes more, even more critical when aimed at mitigating the disproportionate impact on vulnerable communities. We intend to promote ethical technology solutions by advocating for regulated technological innovations, addressing threats to people, planet, prosperity, and peace. The Global Youth Security Council for Existential Threat is committed to fostering collaboration, leveraging partnerships, and advocating for transformative policies to mitigate existential threats. We firmly believe that tapping into the experience and skills of youth committed to advancing a sustainable and equitable future and leveraging this from local to national and transnational levels allow you to hold governments accountable for their to their commitments. Thank you for your attention and support. The Global Youth Security Council for Existential Threats prepared to collaborate and contribute towards a safe and prosperous world for all, signed by Baris Griffin from the Bahamas, Ivana Feldfeber from Argentina, Patrick Sengor, myself from the Gambia, Isaac Olufadiwa from Nigeria, Kolfina from Iceland, Lloyd from the Philippines, Mate from South Sudan, Nor Aziza from Australia, Parachi from India, Shadi from Iran, Talita from Poland, Tania from the Solomon Islands, Victor from the United States, and Yuhan from China. I will now invite one of my colleagues to Talita to come and present on um, climate anxiety. Thank you very much. And a big thank you as well, Fatal. You're doing some yeah. fantastic work and it's a great honor that I can be uh, working with, with all of you as well uh, in my role in the Interaction Council. So um, if we can introduce uh, Talita, uh, please come on the stage. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon and um, good morning or good night uh, to everybody in this uh, session. Thank you very much for inviting us. Um, the, the, Global the Global Youth Security Council. My name is Talita. I am uh, based in Poland, but I'm from Brazil. Uh, I have a background in medicine and epidemiology. That's why my interest is in um, health and climate emergency. And I would like to just uh, bring in a little uh, within the five minutes that we have, just a small perspective on youth and uh, existential threats. So this picture that you are all being able to see now um, is the city of Porto Alegre. Uh, in Brazil, where I'm from, it's in the south of Brazil. This was earlier this year, uh, in April, when heavy rainfall flooded the region, 
uh, the floods affected 461 out of 497 municipalities in the state. 100 of 150 people died. 140 are still missing. Half a million people are homeless and 80,000 people are living in shelters. So if we go back 10 years ago in 2014, uh, there was a technical report describing that by 2040, the effects of global warming could increase rainfall by 15%, which is a significant increase for the region, given that it is surrounded by lots of um, water bodies. So we have rivers, we have the ocean, um, many others within this region. And time passed by, little strategic preventive measures took place after that report was released. And the consequences were as we're seeing now. And then in face of these brutal events, I mean, I'm just giving one example here from um, Latin America, but there are examples everywhere in the world. Many youngsters su are suffering from uh, something called climate anxiety or echo anxiety. And when we talk about climate uh, emergency or everything that's coming to a point or is at the end, we have to remember that there are lots of people around the world who are currently already suffering the consequences of this. This was something that we knew 10 years ago could happen. Nothing was done. It was, unfortunately, all of this happened. It's very sad. Uh, the country is in shock, uh, which shouldn't have been. Um, and then the the youth, when it looks at all of this, it, it just raises uh, the level of anxiety. And here, just to illustrate, uh, this is a study published uh, by Nature in 2021. Uh, they surveyed uh, 10,000 individuals. I chose this study because it's a very robust one. It has lots of participants. Uh, they were aged between 16 and 25 years of age, and they were for ten, from 10 different countries, including high-income countries and low- and middle-income countries. So when we look at this, we see that 27% of the respondents uh, answer that they feel extremely worried uh, answers like feeling sad, anxious, powerless, had a response frequency of around uh, 60%. And all those feelings, uh, they lead to something called catastrophic pessimism. That is when the individual thinks it is too late to do anything at all. Um, and, you know, it's too late to reverse tipping points, for example, so we're doomed. There's nothing to do. And this... Um, echo, anxiety, uh, and catastrophic pessimism paralyzes us, paralyzes a significant amount of our generation. So people with catastrophic pessimism do not want to act because they, according to their view or according to their trauma, because some of them already have echo trauma, um, they don't see any future. And here, of course, we may expand this type of behavior to the adult population as well. Uh, but here we're bringing today the youth perspective. Um, so moving forward, it is perhaps a good idea that we spread the message that the future is not settled um, and that the future is what we work on today, uh, but we need to work and work effectively and with impact. And one of the, re the references that we've been studying, we've been doing research uh, to do our advocacy work uh, within the Global Youth Security Council. One of the uh, works we've been studying is uh, the work of Hannah Ritchie. And um, she's been trying to switch the youth catastrophic pessimism idea into practical action, actions. She battles the idea that we are the last generation with the idea that we can be the first uh, sustainable generation. So when we look at the data, her book, uh, some consider her very optimistic and I'm bringing you the other perspective now, which uh, we had the pessimist and now the optimistic, some consider that she's too 
optimistic. And then on the one hand, she does bring concrete data uh, and she does show, for example, and things that we know, facts that we know that there has been some victories in my country, for example, in Brazil, uh, victories like the protection of indigenous territories, which safeguard biodiversity in our country, which is the first in the world, um, or energy transition, which is mainly something that you see in developed countries. This has been a win. But on the other hand, um, many countries are far uh, from that finish line that marks their, um, their Paris Agreement commitments. So people are already suffering, especially in vulnerable locations, especially in local and middle income countries. And we haven't seen an end, but we have just seen growing suffering. So in summary, I would just uh, like to conclude that, of course, as a youth, we don't have institutional power. We only have our voice. And at the moment, we chose today to just speak about the health related problems, the climate health related problems, uh, which is the catastrophic pessimism because it is blocking our action. Uh, it is blocking the release of the full potential of our generation. Uh, but we need to show that those that do not have hope that what we do today, um, and we need to show the data as well that what we do has an effect, has an impact, and it will have an impact not only for the future, but it will have an impact on them now because they are already suffering from all of this. So if we would like to pass on uh, just one take home message uh, is to really bring on data to show that what we do has an impact to really fight um, the catastrophic pessimism that paralyzes a uh, generation and to show indeed that uh, we need more people, we need more engagement. Um, and what we'll do is, I mean, never too late to act. And if one person can be impacted, that's already worth our um, our efforts. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Talita. A very powerful message from you um, and from the Youth Council, ultimately about the human impact as well on the, the threats that we face going forward, how it affects people. Um, and, you know, I'd really like to emphasise as well, you know, the severity of the, the challenges that we face, and we'll hear more from Yuhan on that in terms of the tipping points challenges. Um, but as you're listening to this, there's always hope. Um, and I, I'd really like to emphasize as a doctor as well, and a, as a health professional yourself in this, even when somebody is critically ill in intensive care, there's always hope. We, we already have the solutions. We already know the interventions. We need to act collaboratively to scale our actions together and act swiftly to actually save patient planet ultimately going forward so and I, I really value the advocacy that you bring to this um and uh, um welcome looking uh, look forward to working further with you and the council to maximize the impact that you can have and i hope that we'll also garner the support from other partners on this panel and from the world academy of art and science thank you um was uh we'll hear more from that later but um can I now introduce uh, Yuhan? Um, she's from China, studying in Dublin, um, and is highly committed uh, to advancing the work on uh, um, the Global Youth Security Council, um, and uh, particularly focusing on uh, the climate mm -hmm. uh, and planetary emergency. Uh, please do uh, introduce yourself and share your presentation, Yuhan, and thank you. So thank you everyone and also my colleague Talita and Fatu for reading the statement and also bringing our concern about like the climate and health related problems. And I know it's a little bit like sad when hearing about this news, but here I, I am bringing some hope and the potential and niches that uh, for our um, Global Youth Security Council that we can leverage. And we are also here like calling for more collaboration toward this. But first of all, uh, we we would like to see when we see the words use. We should not just define these words by the ages. And we are not only like the people who are suffering from the climate changes and the existential threats in the planet, but we are also the practitioners uh, in technology 
engineering and science to really provide the solution. So here, I would like to bring this climate and uh, existential street fears into actions from advocacy into practical research, policy and engineering project that we can work on and also giving some examples. So today's presentation is named uh, the positive climate tipping through the intergenerational dialogue combating the existential threat. But before uh, we start our conversation, I would like to just generally introduce how the our global use Security Council is established to combat the current um, existential threat, like you say in the left of uh, my slide, about we put the people in the centers and also we were trying to solve the uh, synergistic challenges by planet peace and prosperity. And also on the right, you can see we delivered the statement jointly to the House of the Lords in January this year. So you can find this information on the link as well. So here we actually um, propelling this because we want to from turn our current status from the existential threat to the solutions and to really co-create a global future platform for planet, people, and prosperity as well to have this kind of governance, knowledge, and advocacy, and also capacity building. And then before we start our climate tipping process, I just want to uh, get your attention that just uh, this week, in our world, for some 80% of the world's population, there are like 7 billion people. The heat of the past week was twice as likely to occur because of the human starting to burn in fossil fuels. But what's most important and most severe is standing out is how many the heat waves are happening at the same time. It's like a wavering like phenomenon that's happening around the world. The impact of these heat waves and this event were amplified by the warm background conditions. So this is just what happened in the world just now. But this is closely related to the current El Nino event, during which really the warm Pacific waters rise to the surface and transfer vast amount of the heat into the atmosphere has fingerprints around the globe. So this will correlate and trigger the worldwide events, which is connected in different systems in the Arctic, Arctic and in different part of the world, which can trigger the very devastating like effect, like Professor uh, Laurent and team in the Global System Institute um, at Exeter University has just proposed the tipping element. It is the component of the Earth systems, uh, which can correlate together and to trigger this tipping point to the corresponding critical point to forcing and a feature of the system at which the future state of the system is quantitatively altered or being devastated. So this is the general background. But what we would also like to see is the tipping point exists not only in the physical part, but it's in the socio ecology and climate system as a whole to increasingly casually intertwined in the Anthropocene from the climate change uh, biosphere degradation point where we are already triggering some damage and negative environmental tipping points. But now toward what we can do to trigger the positive tipping point, which is in the section four of the global global tipping points report, like published by them as well, to sustainability in uh, the social ecology and technology systems. So to limit this extent of the climate change, there is a widely recognized need to tip the accelerated uptake of more sustainable innovation and early warning in indicators that could be used to inform when should we intervene as a individual, as an agency, as a whole organization. So I'll just uh, make a few examples. For example, in the energy sectors, when we alternatively transform in the current low carbon and renewable energy landscape, the integrated community energy systems coupled with the technology transfer, they can really um, put the increase in carbon price and tipping it into the green growth economic state and to really 
usually trigger a virtuous and positive circle of investment, learning by doing, and also increased growth exposure. And also the current intrinsic social technical tipping points like the transport as service provided by the autonomous vehicles taking over from privately owned internal combustion engine vehicles to the more co-shared like patterns of our current transport ways to our mobility and also to the social tipping po point uh, for example to limit the climate change the global food systems also their in current transformation to transform into a more collaborative patterns to change the exerting the great the greatest leverage of our daily life and etc. So respond to the early warnings by trying to tip the positive changes in society that requires a network of transformative social changes. We need the collective intelligence and collective innovations. So this should be passed intergenerationally. And so we can do this by facilitating the intergenerational dialogue, not just through advocacy, but through different like intergovernmental process to engage the youth voices, but also to create a self-sufficient platform for them to really connect the current capacity to empower, to create an environment, to enabling the empowerment of the use and also the young professional to get the capacity to um, observe and also to control and to manage our future risk. So there are some examples that I am being part of and also we would like to hear about more of your advices and also suggestions. Um, just coming back from the 78th uh, executive meeting of the World Meteorology Organization, uh, we jointly launched a youth program aimed at the young professional in the earth science and meteorology, because uh, we want to use this platform to empower the young researchers in academic side to contribute to the global understanding of the climate change and also the weather related challenges. We want to put uh, the most suffered part of the young professional and the young generations to the front line of research and to have the capacity that they can leverage to really transform this kind of devastating or disaster like we invention. And also the second is the Climate Reality Leadership Corps, which is initiated by the U.S. Um, Vice President um, here. So we have this kind of um, climate training courses in April in New York. Um, uh, just this, this fr Friday, two days after, uh, there will be the European chapters in, in Rome about the climate reality training courses to just empower the youth and also like the young, uh, the youngs in their own community to deliver the right message from how the climate change would really impact them and also to provide a more local value added solution to them. And also we have the Young Champions of the Earth um, organized by the uh, UNE which support and mentor the young environmental innovators around the world. And also we have this uh, youth empowerment in actions initiated by the Global Youth Biodiversity Network to leverage how they can use their indigenous knowledge, just like um, in, in our very first panel, like Mike, oh, you have uh, example, exemplified your um, your experiences in Bali, in Indonesia, because me myself just come back from uh, Indonesia and Bali to see how the people, they use the indigenous knowledge to really empower the nature-based solution and to protect the current biodiversity. And this is something that we are really put it into actions. And also um, we would like to uh, use this kind of um, opportunity to really um, propose and also to ask for your help to see how we can leverage the current resources and also the existing network of the senior experts in the climate change like IPCC, like WMO and something to that to really unlock the new socioeconomic value for both the current and the future generation because as um, me and Joe, we are also in the um, Global Youth Security Council in the policy briefing, we are writing a policy briefing about 
about the intergenerational justice on the climate tipping point, and which we also secured the support uh, from the uh, Professor Tim uh, Tim Lorenzen from his Global Assistance Institute to guide us on the uh, policy briefing. And also, we would like also to call for a more collaborating uh, joint effort to encourage us and to provide us uh, with more and to trigger more uh, tipping points, positive tipping points in the future. And thank you so much. Thank you, Johan. Um, that's really valuable and it really illustrates the role that uh, young people and innovation can play uh, in acting as a catalyst for change as well. Um, and to scale up actions as we go forward. Uh, I'll just give a few moments to wrap up and just to say a really big thank you um, to all the presenters and all the time that they've um, taken to put uh, everything together. Ultimately, answering the question of, are we all doomed? We heard at the beginning that the, the answer to this is probably and actually, many of the presenters today are seriously concerned about the critical situation that we face in the world today. I think ultimately, though, we're only doomed if we're not prepared and if we're not planned. We actually know what to do. Um, we actually have the solutions at our hands. We need to act together, act collaboratively with partners to scale up and speed up our action. We can apply digital solutions, for example, from the Global uh, Futures Platform for Planet, uh, People and Peace. Um, there are already solutions there. There's networks and networks of youth leaders um, which can be facilitated further by the uh, Global Youth Security Council uh, on existential threats, building an alliance, uh, building leadership capacity as well as we go forward. And I think the World Academy of Art and Science has done and can continue to play a really critical role in enabling partnerships, in advocating for change with um, senior leaders uh, and influencing international organisations and the UN going forward. Um, I welcome further partners to join us in this initiative. We need you. Thank you.